Better System Trader, episode 44. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Welcome to the Better System Trader podcast. This is episode 44, and I'm your host, Andrew Swanscott. Back in episode 32, we had a chat with Laurent Bernou, a systematic short seller who spent years working in the hedge fund world, specializing in short selling strategies. He shared loads of knowledge with us in that episode, but we actually had a lot more to talk about. We ran out of time back then, so in this episode, we're going to continue with the chat, covering a bit more on short selling including common problems and mistakes traders make when short selling, the five psychological stages of a bear market, how these stages manifest in market behavior, and where we are now. We also chat about his convex position sizing model, visualizing your trading edge and how to tilt it more in your favor, plus he shares with us a special trick to switch our minds from a flight or fight mode back into a state of flow. We also have some great questions submitted by podcast listeners, so listen out for those. And in usual Laurent Bernou style, we have a few laughs along the way too. But before we get into that, a quick message from our sponsor. How would you like the ability to mirror the trading of some of the best futures and forex traders around in a program designed to take the exact same trades they take in their own personal accounts? Champion traders like Michael Cook and Larry Williams. Well, you can with World Cup Advisors Leader Follower Auto Trade Service. For more information, check the show notes page at bettersystemtrader.com slash 44. And of course, trading futures and forex involves significant risk of loss and is not suitable for everyone. Okay, let's get into it. Hope you enjoy this chat with Laurent Bernou. Hi, Laurent. Welcome back to the podcast. Hello, Andrew. Thank you very much for having me back. This is an honor being here. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you back. Now, you've obviously been a guest of the podcast before, back in episode 32, so I won't go through and ask you to repeat your trading background. People can go back to that episode and have a listen if they want to know more. But uh, today's chat will, will kind of be an extension of that chat in some ways because we didn't quite get to cover all of the topics that we'd planned last time. Mm-hmm. If I can just spend uh, 10 seconds uh, going over the topics we did cover, we discussed how to create strategies on the short side and the risks associated with with uh, short selling. Uh, we also discussed bear markets, the importance of exits, complexity in trading, which I thought was a great one, and the forex markets and strategies. So now I can see why we ran out of time back then. <laughs> <laughs> so now I think today we might continue with a bit of the short selling discussion from the previous episode. Now you've you did cover some of the risks associated with short selling, but perhaps you can tell us some of the common mistakes that traders make when they're short selling or perhaps the reasons why they fail, maybe um, maybe like the top three? Sure. A lot of people approach short selling from a long only perspective. They are long investors and then they need to be short sellers. By the way, before we do this, allow me an introduction of why short, I believe short selling is probably the most underrated asset class of all. Sure. I mean... I mean, there's a website called SPIVA, S&P Index versus Active. And this website, it compare, this is for the U.S., it compares uh, the performance of active managers versus index. Year in, year out, 70, between 60 and 70% of managers underperform their benchmark. Mm. So that means that active managers are more expensive and underperform. So supply, demand. It means that basically a lot of these guys will not have a job in 10 years. Now, why do you need to be a short seller? The secret behind re- raising AUM is very, very simple. In a bull market, when everybody's performing, it's very difficult to get noticed. In a bear market or during bear phases, I should say, during bear phases, people who stand out are the guys who receive the AUM. Best case in point is John Paulson. John Paulson increases his uh, his AUM during the 2008-2009. So the secret to raising AUM is performing when nobody else does. So this is why like short learning to the short selling skills, it might be difficult, 
But it's not a question of, oh, I don't want to do it or whatever. It's yeah. a question of survival. If everybody's underperforming, in 10 years, most of the people will not have a job. That's not a projection. That's a fact. And if you don't learn the skills of short selling, well, it makes it even harder. So that was my introduction to it. Good morning. <laughs> I, guess, <laughs> I guess that also applies to retail <laughs> traders though, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and short sellers are actually pensions, uh, pensioners' best friends. The reason for this is when there are bare phases, short sellers do make money. So you don't need all those like uh, noisy CNBC managers on the bull side because index tend to outperform them, but you definitely need short sellers to look after your pension. That's a bit harsh comment, but I'm afraid that's also a bit of a fact there. So, I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm an active manager as well. I have enormous respect for active managers. I think that they're working extremely hard, but um, it is a difficult job. Mm -hmm. So to come back on the top three, uh, top three reasons why people fail to on the short side. Well, these are prime. I mean, these are more or less the same reasons that people fail in the markets, but they're a bit harder on the short side. The idea behind this is on the market, uh, in the mar on the long side, the environment cooperates. Basically, people you approach it with stock picking and the market does the heavy lifting. Mm. On the short side, it reminds me of The Martian. In The Martian, at the end of the movie, Matt Damon says, this is space. The environment does not cooperate. <laughs> you solve. <laughs> 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 Let me give you a very simple uh, arithmetic example and you will understand exactly what I mean. Mm. Let's pick four stocks, A, B, C and D. A and B on the long side, C and D on the short side. A goes up 10%, B goes down, minus, uh, goes down 5%. On the short side, C goes down 10%, D goes up 5%. So C and D can sell each, can sell each other out and, just by do, and everybody st starts at 100. So A, 110. B, 95, C, um, what, what is that, uh, 90, and D, 105. C and D cancel each other. By doing nothing, by having the same start line, you already have a net exposure differential of 20%. You're 20% net long. Not only that, but if you look only at the short book, you have a smaller bet on C, which is the stock that is winning, versus D, that the stock is losing. So really, the environment does not cooperate. And the way people approach the short side, this is what I call Sherlock versus the Red Queen. There's an, in, there's an information differential, information asymmetry. Everybody, look at the ratings on the street. Everybody wants to buy. Everyone wants to buy. But look at the number of sell ratings or short sell ratings. Actually, we can talk about it, about the Kubler-Ross probably later down the road. But there's, the dynamics of the short selling are difficult. The inform there's information asymmetry, but also the, the mechanics of short selling. So it's not exactly, oh, yeah, there are stocks that will go down and then we go, you go out and sell them. Mm. You need to find there's a cost associated to short selling because you need to locate the borrow. So there's borrowing fee. Speaking of which, never, ever, ever short stocks that have a borrowing fee of above 5% five, five or, or that have... Uh, what is that? Um, utilization above 55%. That means that it's a crowded short. Mm. We can go through that later, but yeah. uh, there's a very practical reason for this. If it's very popular, it means that the upside is the downside is very limited. And not only that, you need to pay the dividend on top of that. So let me give you a very practical example. Let's take a let's say, for instance, you have a stock on the long side that is covered by the entire street with strong buys, 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 whatever that every retail guy talks about that, that is on, the, on CNBC, that is on Financial Times all, the, all day long, then imagine you need to pay 5% dividend on it. Then you need to pay 10% uh, borrowing fee on it. How much upside do you think there's left? Mm. If you flip it on the long side, not much mm. left. So this is why on the short side, you need to go after the stocks that actually people have not yet spotted. Now, there's a difficulty to it. And this is where I would like to transition into the Kubler-Ross, if you don't mind me doing it. Yeah, sure. So the first one is the mindset. There's information, dynamics, mechanics. And then the Kubler-Ross is actually the psychology behind it. Now, this does not necessarily apply to system traders. But 
my belief, I mean, I've been a short seller for about a decade. And I've realized there are lots of, uh, what is that, psychology, like from euphoria to despondency and so on and so forth. Mm. But there's something that really resonated with me very deeply that was the Kubler-Ross model. That actually was my first uh, speech at Fidelity. I mean, they saw me like, oh, French guy, he loves his math. He's going to talk about the Kubler-Ross model. Here we go. Heavy duty mathematics. <laughs> Where's the coffee machine? <laughs> 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 and then I looked at him like, we're going to talk about death. Like, immediately, like, <laughs> they screeched out, what, 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 what? <laughs> and then, <laughs> so the, it goes like this. Basically, the market is, is, a, is an eminently mental sport. And one of the manifestations of this sport is, is in the language we use. We feel emotions, and then we use a certain language, and then we have certain characteristics. And in, uh, I think it was 1962, uh, Elisabeth Kubler-Ross uh, diagnosed, I mean, came out, coined this thing, the, um, the, the psychology of grief, the cycle of grief. And I think it really applies to the market. So it's in five stages. The first one is denial. So for instance, probably, I mean, this is the kind of face that we have for the US markets at the moment. So denial, how does it manifest itself? Basically, you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, I'm afraid you have cancer, and you're going to die in six months. Say, no, 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 it's not possible. I know this short seller over there. I mean, this guy drinks wine, yada, yada, yada. This guy should die, not me. Can't happen to me. So in the markets, how does it manifest itself? Um, basically, I, I've also quantified this stuff a long time ago, is that the most bullish and most bearish estimates are very narrow. The, so basically, the, the forecasts are relatively the same. So there's very low, low dispersion of information. Besides, the, and then the realized volatility increases. So it's a sideways volatile market. That's denial. And then one day, the market crashes. It falls one floor. So a lot of you know it can't happen, yet yet. Uh, look at, I mean, uh, look at uh, all the economic information, which, by the way, is lagging mm. by definition. So this is the first stage, denial. And then all the analysts are like, no, this is not possible. They all have this... Uh, all, all of this uh, product lineup coming through and so on and so forth. Yeah, it might be like a soft patch, whatever. All right. Second one, it's anger. Now, for anger, I mean, a lot of the, the markets around the world are probably in that stage at the moment. Anger is like a, a lot of analysts step in. No, but the market fails to understand the market, doesn't understand the market, hasn't priced in, yada, yada. So they basically try to tell what the market, uh, tell how the market should react. Well, good thing. I mean, those stocks have been outperforming for five, six, seven years. I think the market knows a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> so, how does it manifest itself? This is a very volatile time in terms of market signature. This is where volatility really increases. And this is where there's a lot of revenge trade from the, short, uh, from the uh, fast money. So a lot of the hedge funds, the guy who try to trade quickly, uh, short term, they were buyers and they go revenge trade on the short side. I mean, the, the borrow, the, the utilization doesn't, doesn't increase very much, but it's a lot of anger out there. I mean, a lot of uh, short-term um, short -term shorts, I would say. Mm -hmm. And this is the time when I try to anchor a position. I believe that it's important to anchor a position here. I mean, for my trading style per, uh, particularly, is because I try to catch the longer term trade, so I put a chip on the table just to see. I might be wrong. Might be right. Mm. The, the key about uh, short selling is accept that you're wrong and move on. It's very easy for married men. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure we should go there. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and you know, I, I did a conference in Singapore, and I, and when I said that, like all the ladies in the front were they were like nodding, yes. You got that right. Okay. <laughs> like, okay. Quickly back down. <laughs> and the guy's like, ah. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> speaking of sighing, like this brings us to the third stage. The third stage is bargaining. This is always my favorite. You go to the doctor and say, and ask the doctor, all right, doctor. So you said I had six months left to leave now, four months. Okay, what if I eat my vegetables? What if I watch love comedy romance? What if I stop drinking, smoking cigars? What if I exercise? What if I medicate? Will I live longer? 
So in, uh, in analyst lingo, it's like, okay, now we've taken down our target price. We've stretched the investment horizon from 12 months to 36 months. We've taken down our EPS. Uh, we've adjusted our models, but we keep our rating strong by because the investment thesis is still intact. Mm. And <laughs> how does it reflect? Okay, you're taking your APS down, so all the guys who do earnings momentum, like all the quantity guys who do earnings momentum, they, they start plowing the field and they start short selling. Meanwhile, a lot of the fundamental guys are like, yeah, you know what? I mean, they negotiate with investment horizon. All right, time to leave or time to reduce the bet. So this is basically when people have accepted, implicitly accepted that, okay, the, the, the bull bear fight, the epic fight is no longer there. Like, all right, that thing is, uh, is not really working the way it should be. So the discretionary fundamental guys, they reduce their bet on the longer side and take it to neutral or whatever. Now, after that, this is the depression. And depression, this is where really short seller starts to congregate and becomes a, a crowded short. So depression is basically you don't get out of bed, you stay home, you don't shower, you don't shave. And uh, in analyst lingo, it's like, all right, okay, so this one is for the long-term investor. So if you have a two, three-year investment horizon, if you're confident about the sector, well, <laughs> then maybe you can dive into this one. <laughs> <laughs> and and I used to have this sentence like I was it was brutal, but I always told them like don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I, 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 I'll treat you for a bit. And I always tell them, okay, so fine, that's fantastic analysis then. But if it's a long term investment as you as you think, do you think it should be matched by long term commissions to brokers? And then you see them cringe, their their faces frozen, like oh, don't worry, I was just joking. Meanwhile. As soon as the meeting's over, go out and short it. <laughs> <laughs> and after depression, one day you realize, you know what? The outcome is not going to change. I'm going to die. So I might as well enjoy my last few days. Acceptance. Acceptance is a very seminal moment for a lot of analysts because they had a lot of pain. They grieved their way into accepting that, okay, things are not working. So they're willing to bend the bridge and tarnish their reputation or their standing versus company. And they put a sell rating and they come out with, this is a structural short and the news flow is horrible. So normally they, they all uh, take down their ratings right after the earnings announcement. So like you see a massive downgrade, stock tanks mm -hmm. and boom, 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 3%, 2%. And then couple of weeks down the road, it's just back to where it was before. So there's massive negative news flow, massive uh, downgrade, massive negative sentiment. Meanwhile, stock doesn't bulge anymore. That tells you one thing. If despite all this news flow, it's not going anywhere, it's not tanking anymore, that tells you one thing. That is a buy. That's a time to buy if it doesn't go down, <laughs> despite all this. And surprisingly enough, this is the province of a lot of fundamental guys. Yeah, but you know, between $1 and 50 cents, it can still go down 50%. You're right. Mm. Mathematically, you're right. But ask yourself, are you going to withstand five or six short squeeze at 30% up? That, that they're going to turn your voice from the Barry White, the baritone, into the high falsetto of Barry Gibbs. <laughs> 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 so that was about like so that was my answer long-winded answer sorry about this no, that's okay well you, I, I was kind of going to uh, i was going to ask you about the stages of a bear market but you naturally transitioned into that by explaining how that how that model uh, interacts with the, with the bear market behavior so um you really just saved me asking you a question which was great so <laughs> thank you very much for <laughs> thanks so much for sharing that <laughs> Now, something I was really hoping to cover in our last chat was position sizing because um, we've had a few chats about position sizing outside of these podcast recordings, and I know you have an approach to position sizing I think others will be interested in. Now, we have some questions here that have been submitted by listeners of the show, and one of them asks about your position sizing method. So I think it's probably a great time now to address that. Okay. Um, now, the, the question about position sizing comes from Derek. Now, he's... It's kind of a long question, so I'm going to paraphrase it a bit to save us some time. But he basically, he's followed your website for quite a while and 
the answers that you post on Quora. Uh, his question relates to your convex position sizing method and how it applies to trading. So perhaps could you explain what that is and how it can be applied to trading in both a drawdown and a profitable period? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for following me on Quora. And thank you very much for following my website. I'm honored, I'm humbled to people that people find uh, what I write interesting. So thank you very much. Mm. And um, as for the position sizing itself, all right. <clears throat> okay. My belief is that the most important question about position sizing, and it's a philosophical belief, is like, would you be more satisfied earning a little less than you could? Or losing a lot more than you should. Mm. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's deep. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to the short side, like like I said before, the short side in the on the short side, the environment does not cooperate. So there are two certainties in life: death and short squeeze. And for instance, in the moment, I'm in the middle of a short squeeze, and it's not pleasant. Mm. My my pitch has gone up a couple of octaves. <laughs> so, so because <laughs> on the on the long side the, the environment is much more forgiving. So you can actually use stuff like markets money and go outside your risk boundaries and the market will bail you more often than not. And uh, on the short side on the other hand Short squeeze, they always last longer than you expect and they always go higher than you expect. I mean, you need to be prepared for those. For instance, this one at the moment, when uh, I took out three of my stop losses, which is a bit unusual, and there was one, uh, one ETF that actually had its best at 98% rally, 98% up days since uh, it went down, which has never happened in its history. Hmm. So you need to be prepared for those. And the funny part is that it took the stop loss. It was literally the last final tick it took the stop loss and tank thereafter <laughs> that's gotta hurt <laughs> that's gotta hurt that's gotta hurt because, i mean the way i structure stop loss i have a statistical module for each chart that is embedded in the chart and it calculates based on volatility so some people say three average range some people say 2.8 2.5 mine just actually adapts with the chart mm. but the idea behind the position sizing is because you're you're gonna have short squeeze roughly every other month or something like this, you need to be prepared to lose. And uh, that means that you start from the maximum weight and then take it down. So three components in this, three components in the position sizing that I use, the convex position sizing. And this is something that I, I'm, I'm immensely grateful to you, to Ralph Vince and to Larry Williams, because I had this idea. I mean, I, I toyed with this for years and years and years, and this was... Just click with listening to your podcast. So thank you very much. Oh, um, the idea there is that Larry Williams said that there are people who are like naturally conservative and there are people who are naturally aggressive in their, in their position sizing. And the problem on the short side, the short side is not a stock picking contest. It's a position sizing exercise because your winners get smaller and your losers get bigger. So you need to size them so that they contribute but at the same time, you need to size them so that they don't hurt if they're wrong. Mm. And with the low, with, and you need to up the win rate and the trading edge. So the idea there is how could we do it? And I thought about this uh, double convexity, which is like the risk per trade. Any position size goes with risk per trade times the, the, the AUM. So a lot of people tweak the uh, risk per trade. Like, let's say I'm willing to risk 50 basis points. They tweak this, okay, now I'm willing to, to risk 1%. But it, they leave the AUM untapped. And I thought, okay, how about I apply, how about I marry both worlds, which is like the accelerator with the risk per trade. But if, if the, so it's, pardon my French, if the shit hits the fan, how about I have a, if I have a drawdown, how about I slam the brakes? Mm. So it becomes a game of like the, the optimal driving with a car, you don't drive a car at 100 miles per hour and then slam the brakes. The, the optimal fuel consumption is to drive the car without having to slam the brakes. So how fast can I go? Mm. And there is per trade, basically, it's an up, outward sloping convexity. So as uh, the equity as the, the equity curve goes up, I risk more, I risk more. With the max at the maximum tolerance. Remember one thing, particularly for professionals, I mean, Investors are like teenage girls. 
Teenage girls say they want. <laughs> teenage girls. <laughs> teenage girls say they want to have a nice guy, and they go out with the bad boys and the pool boys. Investors are the same. They say they want returns, but they will react to drawdowns in terms of magnitude, frequency, and period of recovery. So the risk per trade, the maximum risk per trade needs to be calculated such that actually if all your positions, because correlation goes to one on the bear side, if all positions go against you, your investors are not going to walk out on you. That's a very important thing. Tombaso said it. He managed his portfolio not the way he would like it for him for himself, but the ways that clients would stick to stick with him. So earlier on, we, we learned that actually learning the bear side is good to attract clients when your performance are, uh, to perform when other people don't. But if you want to keep your clients, you need to keep that volatility of performance within certain boundaries. So that we're going back to the risk per trade, the maximum risk per trade, and I haven't figured out the exact number and the exact formula for that one, but this is the maximum that you can withstand without, without losing your clients or without losing your marbles. Mm. And if you're not a professional investor, let's say, oh, yeah, yeah, I can withstand 20%. I study effective neurosciences, and if you say, yeah, yeah, don't worry, don't worry, I can withstand 20%. No, then set your parameters at 10% and then divide it by the number of, of positions. The reason for this is because when you reach 10 or 15%, you'll be a different person. Your mm -hmm. brain will react differently. Very important. So then starting from the maximum risk and then going down, after sloping to the minimum risk, at the end of the day, you need to be taking positions. You need to be trading. If you don't trade, you know what? If you don't buy a lottery ticket, you're not going to win it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> On the other side of the equation is the AUM. The AUM, what I call surface. And this one is, an, is also an, uh, this is an outward sloping, um, outward sloping. So basically, the risk per trade is very nervous as we approach, like, as the equity curves grow, so that actually, oh yeah, 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 you can take you can take a lot of risk. But as soon as the equity curve comes down, the risk per trade comes down dramatically. On the other side, on the side of the of the AUM, this is actually it does the other it, it works the other way around. So basically, it buffers like the one two percent, one or two three percent drawdowns, because at the same time you don't want your AUM to fluctuate that much. You want to keep it at max AUM. And then you want, to, you want it to react, like, oh, 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 all of a sudden you have a 5 6% drawdown, then all of a sudden you need to slam the break. Mm. So what happens with my, with my AUM, for instance, is that my max, I stay at max AUM until I, I, I have a drawdown of 5% and so on and so forth. And then as soon as the drawdown comes to 6 7 8 9 10%, my surface is reduced to 40%. So instead of trading like 5 6 7 lots, mm. I end up trading one lot. But I still trade. Now, the third part of the equation is about the risk per trade for the number of positions. Um, because let, let's say, for instance, your, your risk goes up, your equity curve goes up, you would naturally increase your risk. But as you take on more positions, I have a scale-out scaling system, which means that actually I get back in the position. If you take on more positions, the more positions you start taking, trends tend to mature. So you would be left with a maximum risk as a, with a mature trend, which is not good for the equity curve because it would wipe out a lot of the profits that have been made. Mm. So what I do, actually, I reduce the slope. I reduce the max risk by the number of positions. It's actually a very interesting kind of decay. So it looks like a parabolic uh, altogether. Those three components put together, it looks like a parabolic form of... Um, of trading, of residual risk in the portfolio. It is actually very interesting. And it works well. I mean, it works, if it works on the short side, it probably would work uh, also very well on the long side. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks for explaining that. So do you actually have any information on the website about that position sizing model? Um, you mean formulas? Uh, what I can do, actually, I can do, I can do some uh, write-ups with some... Um, yeah, I can do some write-ups. Uh, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put this on the, on the website okay. about the position sizing. All right, great. All right, um, thanks for that. So I think we'll move on to the next question, which is from Marsha regarding Trading Edge. Marsha says, during your interview in episode 32, you talked about the Edge formula. Mm -hmm. Would you talk more about that and what number are you looking for or what insights the number gives you? Um, I have an interesting story about Trading Edge. Every now and then when I meet my hedge fund friends, I'll ask them, like, hey, dude, what's your Trading Edge? And they're like, 
dude, come on, you're a veteran. You don't ask those questions. We're not doing marketing. Come on. And, you know, because when you talk about trading edge, like all of us, I mean, who said that fiction doesn't invite itself in finance? Ask anybody about their trading edge and you'll hear about tales of adventurous analysts wandering about the land to find that nugget. You'll hear about like Sherlock piecing evidences together, but fooling some people all of the time and so on and so forth. I mean, it's a lot of about science fiction, but like trading edge to me is not a marketing gimmick. Trading edge is not a story. Trading edge is a formula, a hard number. And trading edge is what you said, like you said very poshly. Oh, yeah, of course it is. You dismiss this poshly. Oh, this is gain expectancy. So it's basically... <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's the same uh, calculation as expectancy, isn't it? Same formula. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, the, um, I mean, uh, I do asset allocation by trading edge. So basically, I have to tilt your trading edge. I have a, I have a tool, an Excel f uh, file. I mean, I went on your resources on your website. It's all very slick and very nice. And uh, I'll... I'll just share my poor Excel file, but this is actually a very useful tool because um, how to tilt the, the trading edge. Trading edge is a win rate, a win, a win rate times average win minus uh, loss rate times average loss. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the trading edge. Now, how to tilt it, it's, uh, it, first it depends on what type of strategies you're trading. If, for instance, you're trading a mean reversion strategy, your problem is in the left tail. So basically, you make 50 cents, like selling, the, the classic example is a short gamma. Yeah, you're selling out of the money calls, out of the money puts, and you make 50 cents, 50 cents, 50 cents, 50 cents. All of a sudden, big volatility, Boom. like August last year, yeah. lost $150,000, game over. <laughs> yeah. Ask uh, the guys at the LTCM, they thought that Russian bonds was, uh, was deemed safe. Really? <laughs> So the problem is in the left tail, and um, how it works is basically if you don't have a stop loss, if you have open-ended risk, you, it's not about if, it's about when. One day you will go bankrupt, end of conversation. But it's also about the period to recovery. So let's say, for instance, you make 50 cents, 50 cents, 50 cents, you lose 5%. 50 cents every month, or you make 50 basis points every month, and you lose 5%. It will literally take you almost two years to recover. You can kiss your investors goodbye. They will not stay. So we were talking about period of recovery. Mm -hmm. They will not stay. On the other hand, for uh, trend followers, the problem is that they, they have to kiss a lot of frogs. So it's a lot of stop losses. It's a very ungrateful work. And uh, the idea there is like basically it's the aggregate of losses tends to weigh on the winners. So how to till the, uh, how to till the trading edge? The, um, it depends on the kind of strategy that you're trading. For instance, for the mean reversion guys, the first thing is to determine the stop loss. There's an, actually a mathematical formula for that. But let's, let's say that you don't want to put the stop, you need to put a stop loss about three, four times. So the tail ratio, when you have a tail ratio of 0.3, for instance, it means that actually your, lose, your losers take, take up a lot more of your winners. You need a lot of winners to make that up. It's a question of frequency of trading. It's a question of period of recovery. So how do you want to do with the... And this, um, please use the trading uh, edge visualizer. This is really how I build strategies. This is really very, very visual PNL distribution. Like when I saw this, it literally changed my life. I mean, I could visualize, aha, uh -huh, this is my false positive. This is where I should actually work and so on and so forth. Mm. And... Uh, I'll, 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 I'll ship it, and I hope that it, it changed my life. I hope that it will make uh, people's day, at least one day. I'd be very happy with that. Yep. But yep. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> for the mean reversion, guys, is first set a stop loss, and then you need to elongate the right tail. So the right tail is uh, the, the right tail is how do you do that? Let's, a lot of the value guys, for instance, they think, oh, this is deeply undervalued. I'm going to buy it, and as soon as it, and then they, they start to freak out when it becomes sort of fairly valued in their mind. And then they sell to the growth guys who just, yeah, baby. And they're all frustrated. I have a bunch of, I have a very, very good friends of mine who are value guys and they're always frustrated. Like they literally sell to their colleagues and then their colleagues start riding the beta. And it's like, oh, again, <laughs> <laughs> it's depressing for them. And I tell them, why don't you sell half of them 
to them and why don't you ride along with them? So the idea is actually to not sell the entire position, but to sell half the position and then use a different kind of trailing stop loss, not the stop loss that you lose for valuation, but use a different one because it doesn't make sense to you, but it still makes sense versus the market. So you can use a technical trading stop loss so as to elongate the right tail. By doing so, what happens is uh, you reduce the risk on the left tail and elongate the right tail. So it naturally increases the trading edge. Now for the trend followers, that they have a different, um, they have a different PL distribution. The idea for them is to turn the near the near um, the near wins into near losses. So basically, how to make small profits, and this is something that trend followers do very poorly. Like particularly the the fundamental or the more discretionary people. Like when they get into something, they've ride it for a long time, but they don't take money off the table. And stocks zigzag or stocks or whatever uh, asset classes zigzag their way up. So it's good to take risk off the table, generate some buying power, and buy the next one. Because we don't know what tomorrow is going to be made of. If you don't have money to buy a stock, if you don't have money to buy a lottery ticket, you're not going to win very often. <laughs> so you generate buying power, and actually it fluidifies the portfolio as well. Um, the problem with a lot with a lot of people who are trend followers, long-term trend followers, is that uh, particularly on the more discretionary side, is that uh, they have a very uh, static portfolio, like they don't go out and buy new stuff, they don't get new ideas, they have confirmation bias looking at the, their ideas all the time. But they don't, if you take risk off the table, you have buying power again, then it forces you to go out and find new ideas. And one of the tropisms of a lot of the discretionary guys is that, uh, yeah, but why do I buy, why do I buy? It doesn't matter. Buy something, buy anything. If you don't buy, somebody else will. So go out and do it. Buy Apple. You won't get fired on that one. <laughs> <laughs> So this is how to tilt uh, the trading edge on for the trend followers is basically take money off the table, take risk off the table. It fluidifies the portfolio. It changes from a low, a low win rate. It increases the win rate. And uh, the second thing also is the stop loss. I have a, I have a, I've written some, I wrote something about this on my website. It's called the game of two halves. The idea there okay. is a lot of people don't know where to place a stop loss. I mean, it's the perennial, like, cut your losers and ride your winners. The problem is, if you, where should I cut the losers? And if you don't know where, if you don't have a, a, hard, um, a hard formula, the idea is to look at your average win divided by 2. Let's say, for instance, your average win is 1%. You divide it by 2, it's 50 basis points. All right. Every, on, now, you put a minus sign, and every stock that has a contribution below, uh, below 50 basis points, let's say I have 60 basis points, you have it. Just cut it in two. So now you, re you, will have crystallized, uh, you will have crystallized 30 basis points of loss, but then it will take twice as long to reach your average profit. So mechanically, mechanically, your trading edge will increase. It's, I mean, <laughs> it's beyond debate. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's arithmetic. So it's called a game of two halves, and mechanically, it will improve. Now, I mean, we could talk forever about the psychology <laughs> of stop loss. but <laughs> <laughs> I think we're a bit short of time, so we might move on to the next one. But I, I definitely agree that there is a lot of value in kind of visualizing and understanding your trading edge and, and the way you explained it there, the difference between mean reversion strategies and, and trend following strategies. It's quite interesting to uh, consider that stuff. So I will put that trading edge visualizer up on the website so that people can access that and plug their own systems in and see what they uh, see what it can do to help them. So thanks for sharing that one. Thank you very much. Okay, we might move on to shorting strategies. So a couple of people asked a very similar question on how to create uh, shorting strategies. We've got Adonis, Ola and Nikhil kind of asked similar questions on the components of a short strategy. So perhaps you can give us a quick rundown on the um, the components of or how what you put together to create a short strategy. So um, components of a trading strategy, they're basically three, uh, they are three parts. Uh, the most important is the mental edge. The, I mean... You'll be, you will be squeezed, so you need to be prepared for that. Second thing is money management. We covered this through 
the position sizing. And the third one is signals. So I guess I, I'll go through the signals. Yeah. As, as far as uh, short selling strategy is concerned, there are two types. One is mean reversion. And the idea of fairness, like, oh, this has gone on too far. This has gone up too much. It's time to short or this is too expensive. Remember, like, if you short something that has a P of 100, nothing prevents it from going from P of 100 to 3,000. And it's a very bad idea. But to come back to the stuff that I use, I'm a trend follower at heart. So first of all, I define uh, on the signal side. It's, for me, it's less about the entry. It's much more about the exit. So first of all, I define the trend. OK, lower highs, lower lows. Not very difficult. So actually, it's lower lows, lower highs in that order. That's important. And once I reach a lower high, once I qualify, I enter the next bar. Not very difficult. The reason for this is because we just clocked a lower high. So this is the maximum information. I know where the high was. I have an idea about volatility. If I have a, and then I can place a stop loss, which then gives me a decent position sizing. With this position sizing, I can re-rank it. I use a very simple stuff like fixed. I mean, I rank position by size. The bigger, the better. So you're actually waiting for it to give you kind of like a rollover signal rather exactly. than quite a popular way to enter is to wait for a breakout or breakdown. So you're not actually doing that. No, because on the on the short side, it doesn't really work like that. Like it's breaking mm. support, but very often what it does, it breaks support, then it goes down then you feel really intelligent and you feel, oh yeah, I understand the market. You feel like Jesus. But then right after that, there's a squeeze that brings it right to the support level yep. <laughs> and then you wake up on the cross and it doesn't feel that good that day <laughs> <laughs> so i wait for the rollover you know mm. i mean once because short squeeze are reality two certainties death and short squeeze once a short squeeze happen i just need to wait and you know a lot of guys when they short breakouts or when they short fundamental oh yeah they have an idea and they rush at it i'm like you know what i just wait for the tide I just sit back, relax. These guys jump in, they suck up all the borrow, start uh, selling, and then they get squeezed. They exit, and then I get cheap borrow, and then I walk in. <laughs> it's a very lazy man way of doing it, uh, in theory at least. <laughs> so after the rollover, and uh, why not shorting on the way up because I could get a better price, or why not trying to time the extreme. Well, the problem with this is short squeeze, you don't know how far and how long they will go. So it's better to, it's safer to wait for the rollover and besides have more information. Mm. Intermediate high, I have an idea on volatility. I can put my stop loss. I can put my position size. Therefore, I can rank them and so on and so forth. Very simple. Now, this is for the entry. I mean, this is simple in theory. In practice, we, we have a stat modules embedded in each chart. I mean, th there's quite a level of sophistication there. Mm. And um, the privilege of uh, simplicity is that uh, um, it, it imposes itself, that it's sophistication, in, even, even for people who don't understand its sophistication. So anyhow, so that's for the entry. So then comes the exit. Because the difficulty on the short side, as we, as I said before, the environment does not cooperate. And uh, if you want one single entry and one single exit, you'll have to face a lot of short squeeze. So a better way to go about it is as soon as it starts to work, when you feel intelligent, take money off the table. So basically, as you see the next squeeze coming up, take risk off the table. So that's the first partial exit. With, by doing so, you crystallize some profit, you reduce the residual risk, and you can go on. Now, about final exit, there are two types of final exit. One of them, I, I know, Andrew, that you use a time exit, and I use a form of time exit, which is a trend reversal. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I get into some stuff, and it doesn't really work very well, but I wait, I wait until it qualifies on the other side and then exit. Yeah. Before, I used to have a, a straight time exit, like it was 30 or 40 days. And I realized that every now and then the market needs more time to digest information. So I thought, okay, how about I just, if it's still contained within uh, the stop loss, how about um, wait until it qualifies on the other side, close the position, turn it around. And the third, the final one is the stop loss. So the stop loss is not negotiable. Once you're into a position, then the stop loss is 
uh, there's a stop loss, there's a time exit, and there's a partial exit, which means that your position is boxed. It's what I call a concept of boxing a position. So no matter what happens, there will be an exit. And this has a lot of implication. It has psychological implications, particularly on the short side. The problem that people face when they have, have a short squeeze is that the, the inner chatter in the brain starts to go on. Is the amygdala triggered? Is the fight or flight? Is the dorsolateral cortex also firing some, um, firing some chemicals? It's all the ego and the inner chatter. But the good thing about this is if you have bolted all three of those, then if, you've, if your exit is there, if there's a box, then you don't need to worry about this. This also means that you don't need to read the news, you don't need to worry about the chatter in your mind, you don't need to worry about anything, you just need to let it go. You run those three exits. And that is that really brings a lot of peace. It really brings a lot of peace to the mind. That's very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. It soothes the mind, actually. Okay, so the next question is from Graham. Graham would like to know, how do you simulate borrowing costs when testing a shorting strategy? Oh, uh, excellent question. It's the same, uh, I mean, synthetically, it's the same as the cost of margin. Uh, when I test strategies, I put uh, 50 basis points uh, and slippage, 50 basis points commission. So basically, it's a, I mean, uh, it's a round trip of 1%. And I put, uh, and I put margin and I increased, uh, I mean, I reduced the margin. So... Uh, now, the, if the question is uh, if you want more granularity about, uh, like some of them are general collateral, which is like 35 basis points to 50 basis points, depending on, on which jurisdiction you're looking at, or if you're looking at more how to locate issues. The problem with how to locate issues is that, uh, first of all, you should not trade them on the short side. I had a program called the Squeeze Box when I, back in the days, and I dismantled that one because uh, it was basically something that looked at hard to locate stocks and that went the other way. As soon as I saw a squeeze, went long. And that, that's, so you do not want to short uh, hard to locate borrowers, even though it makes sense. What makes sense does not necessarily make money. Being profitable and being right are two different things. Actually, mm -hmm. they are one and the same if you think in terms of process, but if you think in terms of outcome, they're two different things. So do not short hard to locate. Okay, great. Um, so the next question is from Nikhil. Uh, Nikhil says, the majority of ideas for short strategies seem to fail rigorous testing on larger time frames. So should one focus on more active time frames like five minute to two hour based instead of passive time frames daily to monthly? So what have you found? All right. That's a, that's an excellent question, actually. Um, I mean, I... Uh, on my ETF, I shot on daily. Uh, on my uh, with that, on my forex, uh, we sh uh, I mean, I short and I go long as well. And on the forex, we auto trade at 15 and 30 minutes. So, but it actually, but actually, it's, it's interesting because it brings in a, a concept of uh, asset allocation, but diversification of asset allocation based on time. Mm -hmm. That is something that uh, we discovered uh, not too long ago. But. Um, to answer the question, my belief is that probably Nakil looks at it from a break. I assume that he, he starts from a breakdown perspective. And in this case, it probably sort of makes sense that short uh, time frames can work better mm. because there's, there's a squeeze coming up. Uh, it probably relates more to the, the, the exits than to the entry itself. So the, the solution to me is not better entry signal but it's a partial exit and better money management. Yeah. So it comes back to the trading system with three components, exit, entry, money management, and, and the mental side of it. Does it make yep. sense? Yep, that makes sense, sure. Okay, so the next question is from Rob. Now, Rob actually um, sent quite a few questions, which is great, but uh, since we're a bit short on time, I'm going to pick my favorite one, and uh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's number two. I, I think we've covered some of those other questions of his already anyway. So... Uh, the second one that I thought was quite interesting, if you had to start over from the beginning with the knowledge you have now, where would you focus on and what would you throw away? <sighs> That's an excellent question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rob. Well, the, I mean, the first thing, the thing that is the most important, actually, um, I'm, I'm going to be shamelessly advertising something. I'm <laughs> writing a book now. I mean, I... Uh, 
I've been a consumer of the short selling books. I probably bought all everything that is out there, and I didn't spend a lot of money. The thing is, if you uh, want to buy books about longs and so on and so forth, if you stack them up, you're probably going to have a round trip to Mars. It would be a very sad ecologic reality. But if you want books about short selling, I mean, you're not. Go- I mean, even on minimum wage, you can buy them all. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a lot out there. So I thought, okay, maybe it's the time. It comes from the same belief. I want to help people. And I realized that actually short selling is a very important asset class that is underrated, that is underappreciated. Did you know that actually in your in your house every night, there's something that is 150 times deadlier than a shark bite? What's that? The, the probability of you falling out of bed and killing yourself is one in two million. The probability of y- you being killed by a shark bike is one in 300 million. Bottom line, your bed is 150 times more dangerous than, than a shark bike. <laughs> Same with, with short sellers, the, the highly misunderstood creatures. So I, wanted to, I want to write a book from a, from a, a short seller's perspective from a manager, like how do I build a practice? Like, how do I go about short selling and so on and so forth? And a large portion of it is the mental edge. So to come back to Rob's question, my belief is that 90% of trading is mental. And the other half is good math. <laughs> <laughs> so I would... I would really focus on that. And um, I mean, on the short side, it's, it's a very, the environment doesn't cooperate. So it's really the Krav Maga of market psychology. Mm. It doesn't have to be pretty. It has to work. And I believe in checklists. I believe in habits. I believe that great traders are not smarter. They have smarter trading habits. We spent, uh, there was a, a research that we did, like uh, research on automaticity, like basically how much of the day we spend in complete uh, subconscious routines and and, uh, some, and uh, she found that for, we spend on average 45 percent of our day in complete automaticity which is like we do it unconsciously like we have cues rewards routines like oh something happens we do this like for instance you probably don't remember uh, w- what you ate a couple of days ago so it's completely mm-hmm. automatic now i think that the study, the study was really eye-opening but i think that there was a problem with the population because she did this on uh, First year graduate students. So first year graduate students are uprooted from their from their families. They discover the world. They believe that hangover and promiscuity are a lifestyle, fantastic lifestyle at it. So they they have a lot of plasticity in their habits. Now think about an execution execution trader who's been in his job like for five ten years. The guy comes to work. He shows up to work with a lot. Of, gigantic latte believes that actually hangover category three is a lifestyle and there's a lot of automatic automaticity there so if we can automate if we can inscribe into habits our behavior better trading habits then mechanically we will win it's it's also about the execution of stop losses if you make it conscious if there's a community about it and so on and so forth you will fail Whereas if, if, if it takes the same amount of effort as brushing your teeth, you will win. Mm. It's, called, it's called trading fatigue. So mental edge is very important. Then also about the beliefs and so on and so forth. I mean, people say that, yeah, uh, investors are rational most of the time and irrational sometimes. Actually, there's very hard clinical evidence to show that we're irrational all the time, but the market it tends to be forgiving most of the time. So the mental edge is very important. Now, the second thing that I would worry about is uh, money management. And again, people believe that, oh, yeah, they focus on entry. But you cannot achieve superior return just by better entry. I mean, if you, if you drop a $100,000 bet on a horse or if you drop $0.10 cents bet, you will have a very different outcome. Now, the question is how many times can you afford to drop 100,000 bets and, and, and waste it and so on and so forth. So money management is the second one I would worry about. Hmm. All right. So the next question is from John D. Um, actually, John D is asking about exits, which we've already covered already. So uh, we'll move on to the next one. If I can just ask two more questions, then we'll wrap up for today. So, okay. So the next question is from Jeremy. Jeremy says, "I'm really keen to learn more about the appropriate use of leverage in a trading system." Mm-hmm. While I'm sure most would say it depends on the system and the trader, which of course it does, I'm really keen to hear more about how the pros determine how leveraged each system should be 
given the product it trades and the time frame it trades. What's considered too high and what is considered too low? So what do you, um, can you make a comment on, on that? Oh, that's an excellent. That's an excellent question. Wow. Um, all right. For the for the sake for the interest of time, for instance, at the moment I trade ETF and uh, it's le- and I have access to six times leverage on the forex. We have access to one hundred times leverage. Now, it all comes down to how much you're willing to lose in your equity per se. And I'm coming uh, and I and I developed this concept particularly. Uh, I come from a low net exposure environment institutional loan exposure, loan exposure environment. But I came to realize that if you want to keep like market neutral all the time, what happens is that you'll have to cut trends short. So I came uh, with a new concept of, uh, equi- of uh, equity at risk. Because I trade in tranches, the older trends is basically risk-free. But how much is too, uh, how much is too much? That's a very good question. It also has to do with psychology, with your tolerance for losses. It comes back to the same down, the same old thing. Like, determine how much you're willing to lose, divided by two or three, and that will, and then work it backward from there. Because at the end of the day, there are three components: it's the mental, the money management, and uh, the signal. Signal is the least important. Money management is very important, but there are two sides of the capital: financial and emotional capital. If you if you break your financial capital, you probably won't be able to trade for a while. But if you break your emotional capital, you won't be able to trade at all. And it's a very different game. Mm. You will be a different person. Mm. So trade with levels that you feel comfortable about, that you feel not comfortable winning, but that you feel comfortable losing. Divide it by half, and that will give you a good idea of your leverage. Does it make sense? Yeah, that's uh, great advice. Thanks, Laurent. Okay, so we might just take a very short break here. Laurent is about to share something he calls the Jedi mind trick. But before we can share that, here's a quick message from our sponsor. Are you looking to diversify your portfolio? How would you like to mirror the trading of some of the best traders around in a program designed to take the exact same trades they do? World Cup Advisor's auto trade service lets you do exactly that. And with the launch of Michael Cook's new Omega program, you can now join with an initial investment of just $15,000. Michael has his own money on the line, right along with his subscribers on every trade he makes in his Omega account. World Cup Advisor identifies futures and forex trade leaders through rigorous screening, including live trading evaluation in the World Cup Trading Championship competition, and enables subscribers to mirror their trading buy for buy and sell for sell. As a subscriber, if your fill price is not equal to or better than your lead trader's fill price on any trade, the trade is commission free from your authorized broker. There are more than a dozen futures and forex programs to choose from and you can view complete actual performance data before subscribing. To learn more, check the show notes page at bettersystemtrader.com slash 44. Trading futures and forex involves significant risk of loss and is not suitable for everyone. And now back to the show. Okay, so I might just uh, switch over to a trading psychology question to um, wrap it up today. So a question from Jim. Jim asks, the mind plays tricks on us even with a successful system. So as a system trader, what methods do you use for the mental part of systematic trading? All right. One thing to understand about the mind is that self uh, Daniel Goldman, the, the writer, wrote uh, Emotional Intelligence, wrote a fantastic book beha- before this about self-deception. Self-deception is a built-in feature of human beings. It's like nose, eyes, long legs. Basically, the idea is that Self-deception, we, we, de- we spend our days rationalizing what, our actions. And the, the funny part about this is that it's a mechanism that covers its own tracks and it's a mechanism whereby intelligent people are more susceptible to it. So luckily, I'm immune to it, as you can tell. And, uh, <laughs> but a lot of intelligent people actually are very good at rationalizing their decisions. So not only don't we are very bad at making the right decisions, we rationalize them all the time. This is why people say, oh, yeah, I buy this thing and I sell when the, when the investment thesis changes or when the story changes. Actually, you will rewrite the story all the time. Another thing about this is Al Hirschfeld in New York University, I think, he came out with this theory about future brain. Now, that one is fantastic. This, uh, this has a lot to do with trading edge, with stop losses. And this is, I mean, when I, it's just really amazing. It, 
he basically put a bunch of uh, volunteers through an fMRI and he asked them to project themselves with future financial contribution, how much they should contribute, how they saw themselves, and so on and so forth. And he, and then he asked a bunch of questions on, about like their, belo- their loved ones and so on and so forth. And then he compared the, the two brain scans. What he came out to realize is that when people talk about the beloved ones, when they talk about their families, that's an affective part of the brain that is triggered. When they talk about their future self, when they talk about the financial decisions they're going to make in a few years, it invokes the frontal cortex, which is uh, the thinking brain. It has, doesn't have any emotion attached to, the, to this. Meanwhile, it's the same self. Like I would see myself in five years and I would think about it. I would not be emotionally attached to it. So this basically brings a whole field of rationalization. This is why people, when they say, yeah, yeah, you know what? I want my six pack abs in a few years. So then in, uh, in two years, I'll have my six pack abs. But meanwhile, today, this is why I can have a pizza, wash it with a beer and smoke a cigarette. And I will be healthy. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> how does it work in the... How does it work in the portfolio? A lot of guys say, yeah, sure, I'm going to clock my 20% annualized. Yeah, no worries, I'll do that. But meanwhile, I have a whole bunch of stuff that is festering in my portfolio. I don't need to worry about those today. Well, actually, if you don't worry about those today, those will have an implication tomorrow and so on and so forth. So we, the mind plays tricks on, a, on, on ourselves. So I would, I would really, I, this is something I, I do. I, it's switching from um, outcome to process. Example. I have signals, and every day I journal this on a Google Sheet. I have signals, I take this, uh, and I have the number of signals, I write the number of signals, and I write the number of signals I execute, whether it's stop loss, I have checklists. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, here's a very interesting thing I'd like to talk about, the, I, the, the Jedi mind trick, that would, something that would transform the fight or flight into, into flow state. Can I talk about it? Yeah, sure, it sounds great. So... Rewind back to January 2015, January 1st, 2015, we fly with the family to, uh, to Vietnam and we're, we're in a hotel and another gentleman walks into the, the car. The guy is like dressed like he's going to the North Pole. And I look at him like, oh, so I suppose you're going to your native Stockholm. He looks at me like, I am from Bangalore. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, <laughs> and I said, yeah, the fair city of Shishi, Avi Shankar. Wonderful ashram, spent a week there. Then we started a started conversation, and I'm fascinated with checklists. Again, it deals with habits. So we talk about it, and I ask him, like, do you mind asking me why you dress like this in the middle of Vietnam, 30 degrees? Like, I'm going into flight sim. Then he tells me, like, it was ex-Indian military, and I find it's commercial. I'm going into flight sim, and it's really cold. Okay. So I teach him this Jedi trick, and the next day, when Dalat, I receive a call from him. It's, hey, this is Sanjay. I'm like, oh. So you're calling from Stockholm? I am from Bangalore, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes on like, so I wanted to, th- he says, I wanted to thank you because yesterday I, I did the thing you recommended and he clocked his second highest score over how many thousands of hours of flight sim. Like, wow, this thing really works. So here's the story. Mm-hmm. The, the problem is that when we under fear and when we're in the extreme stress, we have the fight or flight. So it's triggered from the uh, amygdala and um, the anterior singular, anterior singular cortex as well. So there's a cocktail of norepinephrine, uh, adrenaline, corticoid, very, very powerful, potent uh, cocktail. And the way the fight or flight uh, is, works in the brain is actually it freezes the frontal cortex. It freezes non-essential uh, activities. So, for instance, it stops digestion, it stops thinking, it freezes non-essential activities and it preps you for combat, sweaty palms, or for, or, for, or for fight or flight. Now, you can't talk your way out of it because the, the thinking brain is de-engaged, deactivated. So how it works is um, you need a physiological switch about it. You need, to tell physiolo- you need to tell your brain that it's okay, that the danger that is perceived is not lethal and you can overcome it. That's step one. Second thing is then you can engage into some action. So let's go, let's go through the, the exercise. The idea there is there's one uh, function that is entirely volitional, and I, and I thank Mark Ryan, who's an NLP a master practitioner for the technique. You need to breathe twice as long as you inhale. 
So exhale like you in, inhale like one, two, three, and exhale one, two, three, four, five, six. So this naturally slows the heart rate. So if it slows the heart rate, it comes, reduces the blood pressure, slows the heart rate. You do that for about a minute or two, and consciously, and the one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on and so forth. <laughs> so it slows the heart rate. At which point, basically, it comes the it comes the brain, and then because you're in fight or flight still, and they're very powerful co cocktails, you need to de-engage the you need to de-engage it. And the way to do it is to look up, and we win tunnel vision. So you need to have to look 180 degrees. You need to have a broaden the, your vision, your vision horizon to 180 degrees instead of a narrow 30, 180. And you look up a little bit, you raise your chin, look up a little bit, you, you look at something in a distance. So what it tells the brain is there's no danger. It's okay. You've come, you calm your physiological response. Meanwhile, you still have those powerful chemicals in your body. So in your brain. So you still have uh, the fight or flight chemistry in, in you. And the interesting part is that the flow, and this is a book, uh, The Rise of Superman from Stephen Kotler, the guy who did the, the Flow Genome Project, fantastic book. Um, actually, the, the chemicals of fight or flight and chemicals of flow are roughly similar. That's a question of concentration, mostly. So then you can engage in, in, uh, in the activities that you know. And this is where actually, where it makes sense to pull out checklists. Mm. And this is why my pilot friend, he basically engaged the checklist. He felt time distortion. He did it for four hours. And you're into flow. You do repetitive activities, stuff that you know, stuff that you're familiar with. Like you're not going to write, uh, I mean, you, if, for instance, you're a fundamental discretionary, you're not going to start doing, uh, like, trading convexity and trading vegan and theta, uh, vegan and gamma. But you can actually do stuff that you're familiar with. And this is where checklists are important. Why checklists are important? And they're vastly overseen in finance. Surgeons use checklists. Firefighters use checklists. Mm -hmm. Pilots use checklists. Yeah. Military use checklists. The idea there is that it frees up mental bandwidth. You execute them sequentially, small sequences. So it frees up some mental bandwidth. And this 1% or 2 or 3% bandwidth that enables you to think clearly or to execute clearly when everybody else is panicking. If you're the Iceman on a trading desk, when everyone else is panicking, this is where you make money. This is where you're better than everybody else. All it takes mm -hmm. is two, three, four percent better than everybody else and compound it over time. This is when you make better decisions. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's a great answer. All right, thanks, Lauren, for uh, sharing that with us, um, especially that uh, Jedi mind trick. I'm sure that's going to be helpful for people. Um, so that just about wraps up for today, I think. We've answered most of the questions that we can. There were some questions there that we didn't quite get to for timing reasons, so apologies to those people who submitted those questions. But I think, yeah, we had a, a really good chat today. Um, now, is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we wrap up? But, well, um um, I'm, I'm thankful for this second opportunity. Um, I'm very grateful. And if people want to reach me, they can go to the website. Um, I'm writing a book at the moment. It's not easy. <laughs> well, actually, we can edit all this. No, I, I don't think I have uh, much to add up. I mean, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful. That's my answer. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> We're very grateful as well. So thank you very much for um, spending time with us today. Yeah, sharing your insights into short selling and bear markets and some trading psychology stuff in there as well, some risk management. So it's quite a well-rounded uh, conversation. So th thank you very much for that and um, wish you all the best for the future. Thank you very much. All right, cheers. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Bye. Well, another entertaining episode with Laurent today. He, he discussed a couple of interesting topics too, of course. Uh, the first one I, th I thought was interesting was the convex position sizing model. And I, th I found this technique uh, quite an interesting approach to reducing position size in drawdown and increasing it during periods of high performance. So uh, Laurent is planning to write up some information on this approach, which may be ready at the time you're listening to this uh, recording. So if you'd like more info, head over to the show notes page at bettersystemtrader.com slash 44, and I'll put a link there when it's available. Now, something else you'll see on the show notes page for this episode is the Trading Edge Visualizer. Now, this is the actual Excel spreadsheet that Laurent uses 
to measure the shape of his P&L distributions, uh, which, as Laurent mentioned in our chat, can really help to identify areas for improvement depending on strategy style. So if you're interested, it's a free download. Head over to the show notes page for this episode, bettersystemtrader.com slash 44. You can get it there. Also, if you have any questions for Laurent and I, you can post those in the comments section of that page and we'll get back to you. Now, before we wrap up for today, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all those who submitted questions for Laurent. We covered most of them, so I hope the answers were um, really helpful for you. And I should also mention that we've lined up some huge guests for the next month or two. Now, I can't reveal their names just yet, but I will be sending out an email giving you the opportunity to submit some questions for them. So look out for those emails in the coming weeks. And it's a great opportunity. And if you're not on the Better System Trader emailing list, just join up on the website. It's free and you'll get the opportunity to submit questions too. Anyway, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Laurent and thanks for listening to Better System Trader. Thanks for listening to the Better System Trader podcast. The next step is to head over to bettersystemtrader.com for more expert tips, practical advice, and exclusive content. Catch us next time for even more great ways to improve your trading here on Better System Trader. Better System Trader.